Welcome to the program. We're going to be talking a fair bit about politics this week, but we're also going to be talking about irrigation and a bit of stress management. In just a moment, it's Dennis Carter and cropping. Dennis, I know it sounds ridiculous, but should we be looking at next season now? Yes, Rob. Um, cropping farmers really need to um, talk to their companies that they, they work with and their agents, and uh, nobody likes surprises. And um, the marketing people need to know what's going on in terms of uh, lining up contracts and crops to grow next year. And um, they will have overseas people that they need to talk about pricing that needs to be talked about, exchange rates, all sorts of things, um, dressing, logistics, all types of things like that. And so the farmers really need to be lining up those fields and those crops that they feel uh, confident to, um, to handle mm -hmm. and, and, and their paddock suit, um, you know, in terms of the, the rotation and weeds and fertility. And then the farmers need to look at their business and say, well, okay, I can store that, don't need to store that, or uh, this is the cash flow that it will generate or not generate, and, and, and do work through all those business things. But in, in talking to their partners um, in the business, which are the, were the companies that buy their produce um, and seeds, is, is very, very important to start early, put the signals out there. It may be that you can't get the area you want or the variety you want, but it's, it's, a, it's a matrix to be worked through. And I guess also pollen is something that you should go and talk to your neighbours about if you're doing specialist seeds. Well, absolutely, neighbours and indeed those companies that they're working with because um, through the skid scheme, they scheme in a lot of crops, they need to look at the, the isolation you either have or haven't got or maybe they can share the same variety with a neighbour. So all those options need to be signalled, talked about early so that we can do it in an orderly fashion. Sounds good. Now, chemical withholding periods, I know it's an old one, but it's still... Well, it is an old one, and it's a very, very important one because of our um, food safety uh, requirements, and indeed, we all want to eat healthy and, and safely. And so, um, looking at things like uh, um, silage and baleage, um, if you've sprayed it with a fungicide to um, keep it growing, they have different withholding periods to basically if you take it through for grain and what's required for the grain. So rough um, rule of thumb is that uh, the um, baleage and that type of thing, there's seven to 14 days difference between uh, a baleage cereal crop and what's required as, as a grain crop in terms of withholding period. So um, you need to start counting back from when you expect to harvest mm. those crops and say, right, I can use this product, this product or this product knowing that you're working within those safe um, withholding periods. And those withholding periods, do, do you, on the day, or, or is there any leeway at all? No leeway at all. No leeway at all? No, no. Just, in fact, allow yourself a little bit of a safety margin because um, if you get a Norwest spell and the crop uh, ripens slightly prematurely, you may want to go and harvest it. But if it's yeah, good still idea. within that withholding period, you'll have to wait. And, uh, and waste an always day, Potent <laughs> potentially. Exactly. Now, changing the subject totally, lawns. Yes, um, most farmers have houses, one, yeah. or, one or two, <laughs> or maybe even a batch. And in terms of um, looking after the lawn and irrigating the lawn, farmers really like to see um, something green around them, even if it's their lawn, if they can't have the whole farm green. Um, and so looking after the, the weeds in terms of um, taking out things like clover, and of course, most people uh, don't realise that if their lawn's full of clover, clover grows twice as fast as grass, especially if you're watering it, and so you have to mow your lawns twice as often if they're full of clover. And then, of course, there's the issue with um, clover flowering and, and young children and bare feet mm. with bees. Exactly. All of that. And then there's the issue of um, what products you've used and the um, contamination of the lawn clippings and for how long. And what are you going to do with them? Are you going to put them in your compost? Are you going to put them at the gate? Which you can't do. The, the council will talk about things like uh, uh, lawn clippings sprayed with um, uh, Versatil, where it's gone to commercial um, composting and gone out and been sold and ruined things like tomatoes. So oh, you don't think about stuff like that. No, you don't. And and you know that that's that was a big one. And so you have to watch those things. So. 
I think probably best that um, they don't go into composting and that um, you, you play it safe because believe you me, I've done it. Um, it kills tomatoes and it looks like there's some sort of hormone effect and you may have um, used grass clippings that were composted a year previous. It still persists. So things like um, picloram as well and, and uh, triclopur as well as versatile. You also can affect things like some of your lovely trees, like anything that's a legume, um, kawai and, and um, wattle, those types of things. You spray versatile around the root zone and then water it. It'll go in and of course very, very good at killing legumes. Ooh. So th there's a bit of a minefield there and a bit of a safety thing that's yeah. required. Because you don't think about it, it's just a lawn. Exactly. Exactly, yeah, right. But farmers seriously should be working very hard on their businesses now. Yes, Rob, and, and this time of the year, farmers uh, do tend to um, head down, tail up, and really get into working their farms in terms of you know, the spraying, the irrigation, all that sort of thing, and don't really sit back or take time to say, let's not work in the business quite as hard. Let's be smart, work, work smarter, not harder, yep. and let's work on the business. This is, you know, in forward planning and things that they can do to simplify things, uh, make them easier, all that type of thing. They need to take time, sit back, work on the business, not in it. Now that leads me to stress and water levels because they do go hand in hand. <laughs> yes indeed Rob, well the, the water levels at the moment and the stress is quite high in terms of... Um, the water levels what, are low and the... <laughs> stress exactly. is high, water levels are low yeah. and so um, that's what happens out there and at the moment the monitor wells are um, quite a bit lower than the October mean that's been out there, quite a bit lower and indeed the uh, Central Canterbury Plains is on um, restrictions already from the Rakaia River and that means that those who want to water out of that system have to purchase additional water from Lake Coleridge. So that is quite expensive. That is more expensive than the water out of the Rakaia. So um, that is quite scary. It is very scary. It gives you an idea of, 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 of where we're at and uh, adaptive management and those sorts of things that come into play. So, and yet the uh, place looks green. It does. Well, we're actually going through a green drought at the moment, believe it or not, and we're seeing grasses and things like that go from the uh, sorry, the uh, vegetative phase, which is October, into the uh, reproductive phase, which is November, when the seed heads start coming up. It's still looking green, but there's absolutely nothing there. There's nothing in reserve, nothing in the top soil strata to say that two days of Norwest and that green will be brown. As simple as that. So we're very, very close to a green drought right now. Right now, which is scary. I've got uh, Tony Davron going to be coming on the program shortly, so no doubt we can talk to him about that as well. But in just a moment, we catch up with the Minister for Primary Industries. <music> Minister, big week for, for Canterbury, but probably also the whole of the country this show week. Oh, it's massive. About in the mid 90s, they decided to combine the New Zealand Trotting Cup and the show into a one massive event. And I was at the uh, New Zealand Trotting event this week as Minister of Racing. 22,000 people turned out there, beautiful day, and I'm back a couple of days later to get involved in the people here celebrating the primary industries. This is typically the farmer's day today. There'll be about 100,000 people that come through the gates over the next few days. This is a very important event because it connects Christchurch City with agriculture. And uh, people talk about the disconnect. I don't think it's as big as perhaps what people think. But importantly, there's an opportunity for the city dwellers of Christchurch to understand the importance of the primary sector to them. A lot of the money comes in from rural communities into the city of Christchurch. And it's great when you walk around and have a look at the animal nursery tent here where kids are engaging with the animals and you know, mating sheep out of season so that they have the opportunity to see a lamb being born. It's hugely exciting for them. So the connectivity on the back of this event grows and importantly there's that connection between city and rural and I think over time it's just going to get stronger and stronger. What have you got up your sleeve for the racing industry? <laughs> We're doing quite a bit actually with the racing industry. Uh, we've just clarified uh, through the IRD in terms of breeding and taxation, so we're clarifying some aspects there, a little bit more work to be done. 
I've set a working group going. They've just reported to me on offshore leakage. That's an issue that's been ongoing for the industry. That's whereby New Zealand is bet offshore and we'll never be able to stop that uh, for a whole variety of reasons. But also offshore bookmakers coming in and not paying a fee. Uh, and you know, So we're looking at all of those things and uh, in due course I'll be releasing that report and talking about the government's response. But it's an important industry. It's hugely important for Canterbury. It's worth about 1.6 of GDP, there's about 17,000 jobs and when you overlay those that volunteer and are also associated with the racing industry it grows to about 50,000 so it's a, quite a big part Serious of the, call. Yeah, quite a big part of the New Zealand economy. Agriculture, what have you got up your sleeve there? You're looking at making more money for the farmers. In terms of aquaculture? No, agriculture. Oh, agriculture, well it's hugely important for Canterbury, what we're doing there is uh, trying to increase exports but at the same time we're very mindful of the environmental footprint. So today we've just released a report, the Business Growth Agenda, focused on natural resources with Minister Joyce the lead but other ministers are part of that. We've got 37 projects underway and importantly we believe that we can grow the economy, particularly in the primary industries, and also reduce our overall environmental footprint. How are we going to do that? Well, yeah, we'll that was do my th next question. We'll do that <laughs> with research and development. We're making investments with Primary Growth Partnership, Sustainable Farming Fund. MB is also making significant investments. We want to provide the tools for farmers so that they can access those from the toolbox to try and reduce their footprint. There's a huge amount happening in terms of irrigation, lysimeters, measuring what's happening on farms, centre pivots that can now be turned on and off with a touch of a phone. You know, it's amazing technology. So farmers have the data out there. They understand that they need to make some changes inside the farm gate. We're going to try and provide the tools for them to do that so that they can farm within the limits that have been set. Exports, as far as access is concerned, we talk TPP, I guess, but you should be delighted. Oh, it's hugely significant, this one for us. Uh, we're talking about 11 countries, uh, you know, the, the biggest economy in the world, the US, Japan, number three in the world. We've been trying for over 25 years to get a free trade agreement with both of those countries. Hugely important that we are a part of this agreement. Uh, it's worth over 200 million in terms of just tariff savings and then you overlay the potential of it, it's 2.7 billion by 2030. 800 million new consumers for us, so we remove the tariff obligations, open up new markets. You think about what happened in China, no one ever thought that China would be as successful and as important as it is now for us as a number one that bounces around with us in Australia, whether they're first equal in terms of um, you know, opportunities for us. But this one has got huge potential, so it's only going to get better. And then you think about what's happening with the European Union, that's just been kicked off, the Prime Minister uh, kicked off the next stage of that in terms of doing a detailed report on the opportunities with New Zealand and the European Union. Ultimately we'd like to get uh, more free trade access into that market. Then also Chinese Taipei, in the last couple of years, that was signed off the end of uh, 2013. That's grown a huge amount. It was worth about a billion dollars. In two years it's now 1.2 billion. So just, you know, th these are small incremental gains, but 200 million has been picked up from our exporters being able to access into Chinese Taipei. So these are very important trade deals that this government is extremely focused on. The other one's Korea that's just gone through the New Zealand Parliament. So we're doing what we can to open up exciting new times, ac market access opportunities. Very exciting times. Yeah. Finally, biosecurity, you, you're, entire, you're in with MPI and dogs and making sure that their borders are safe. Yes, we are. We're doing a hell of a lot in this area. More money in this year's budget for biosecurity. We're rolling out a border levy which means travellers will have to pay at the border instead of taxpayers so it's a user pay service. We're also celebrating, we've had the sixth signing of the government industry agreement just recently with forestry and a couple of others are due to come on board in the next wee while as well. That's where they come and partner with MPI and preparedness and response. We've seen that play out with Queensland Fruit Fly and Greyland in Auckland where our kiwi fruit and pit fruit industry were sitting around the table with MPI on that response. 
We've also got a biosecurity 2025 strategy underway. You know, we can't have a target of doubling the value of our exports by 2025 without focusing on the strength of our borders. And today's about celebrating uh, the dogs. We've had a dog detector team program underway for 20 years, so it's a little cake to celebrate 20 years and what a great job these dogs do at detecting you know, animal pests or food on carrying in through um, luggage and what have you, and uh, they are a very important tool in terms of strengthening up our biosecurity borders, and we're increasing the number of those from 40 to 60, and they'll be working at uh, international airports and on the cruise line and on the mail pathway uh, by this summer. So we're doing what we can to strengthen up the border. After the break, we're going to be talking irrigation and catching up with Amy Adams. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, onTheLand.co.nz. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active amino acid biostimulant, natural, 100% pure, manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active amino acid biostimulant, the way the world is growing, working with nature, good for the plant, good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Tony, is it the calm before a storm? Uh, well, actually, I'd, I'd, I'd refer to it, Rob, as the perfect storm. I mean, there's a lot of things that have fallen into line this year uh, that, you know, we, we talk about the perfect storm. We have lots of little things that s stack up and they all they all contribute to getting the perfect storm. And and this this is a season, and, and I've alluded to it in, in previous interviews over the last probably five or six months that the potential was there, but all of those things are stacked up now. And we've got uh, the, the three or four big biggies that are lining up for the perfect storm or a, or a pretty serious drought. Um, and that is that we've got um, very low groundwater levels, um, more than somewhere around about 80% of all of the bores that Environment Canterbury monitors in the region uh, have water levels that are uh, below the long term October average. So when they did their survey, last survey at the beginning at, at the beginning of um, November and they put their report out at the end of October sorry uh, then then that's where we were at now we, we're a month on from that so things are worse than they were um, prior when that report was produced uh, we've got um, uh, outside of irrigated areas we've got virtually no soil, soil moisture reserve I mean if you go into areas like North Canterbury and look at how much of the soil has been wetted up after the little bits of rainfall we got. We we're only wetting up the top 30 or 40 millimetres of 30, 30 or 40 millimetres of the soil and below that it's just dust still. So we're surviving on bits and pieces and 
People refer to it as a green drought. Well, I think it's worse than a green drought in those areas because we're not actually generating growth. We're just literally keeping things alive. Uh, we've had extremely low rainfall. Most of Canterbury has only had, uh, this year, about 40% of its av long-term average rainfall. So we've got all of these things that are stacking up to, towards a perfect storm. And now, we've, now, that, now everybody has confirmed that um, that that we have El Nino conditions. Well, mm. it's interesting. I mean, I follow a I follow a weather follow a weather site in Australia called Weather Zone, and they've been warning Australians since about May and June that El Nino is coming. This is what it's going to mean. Get prepared. And suddenly, uh, we've just realised that, or the farmers have not just realised. They've known this is the has been here for a long time. You know that we've been going through this since May. Uh, it was really interesting in one of the ag uh, reports that I get that the Reserve Bank, uh, November the 3rd, didn't raise the cash flow rate because of a pending or potential drought. And I thought... Uh, they I haven't been listening to On the Land, have they? They haven't been listening to On the Land. And I, I seriously wonder where some of their advisors are housed because, my goodness, if you come into areas of, like, Canterbury, for example, or go into the areas of, of Marlborough and you go into parts of the wider wrapper. Uh, man, we've been looking down the barrel at this for four or five months, not just in the last month. So you sort of think, well, gee, they've finally woken up that, the, that things are really quite serious. Um, and it's sort of a retrospective look at things rather than being a proactive look at things, unfortunately. It's a bit scary that can Central Plains, for example, is on restrictions and the opua has got a question mark over it. Yes, it is. Um, opua to a lesser extent because uh, opua is very dependent upon uh, the easterly, southeasterly type storms to actually get the inflow they need into the into the dam. Um, they've benefited a bit from a relatively good snowfall. Um, you know, in places like Mount Dobson had really good skiing this year, so they've benefited a bit from that. But if you look at where our weather comes from at the moment, you know, um, we're getting most of our weathers coming in from the west and the southwest. Well, they don't generate rainfall significant enough to actually give us flows in those lowland streams, which is what we need for Opua. So Opua to a, a lesser extent. But what is surprising is when we have El Nino conditions, which is westerly dominated, northwesterly, westerly, southwesterly dominated, that the rainfalls aren't spilling into the headwaters of things like the Rakaia River, for example, or into the into the Waimakariri River. Um, just the other day, I was talking to one of our clients that absolutely worried about the clarity of the water that's coming down the race on the Waimaki Irrigation Scheme. Um, th that's a real concern to them. When they can see the bottom of the race, they're going, hang on a minute, this is not a good sign. We need to see some dirty water coming down there because we need it to be coming from the rainfall that's spilled over into the upper catchment. So the fact that particularly thing, a, a scheme like the Central Plains scheme, and it also affects schemes to the south of the river as well, such as Bahil Chertsey, that we're, we're, running, we're running against restrictions in November is pretty scary for an alpine river which should be getting replenished from El Nino type conditions. Can you explain this, the water storage access? Yeah, so if, you, um, if you're a, a, a shareholder in one of the schemes that uses Rakaia River water, like uh, Bahil Chertsey, for example, or the Acton scheme or Central Plains water, then you can buy storage in Lake Coleridge. So you can buy a proportion of the volume of water that you're going to use each year ahead of time you have to sign up for this water before your irrigation season starts and you can store that up in Lake Coleridge. There's a limited amount of storage in Lake Coleridge. Uh, so it's a first come first serve um, um, process. At the moment, because Central Plains in particular and even Bahul Church is not fully developed, then there is spare water up there. So, or spare capacity up there to buy. But you pay for that water whether you use it or not. So at the moment it's around about eight cents a cubic metre. So if you if you want to store uh, 100,000 cubic metres, then it's going to cost you $8,000 to store that water. You pay that whether you use it or not. At the moment, because the river's on and off restrictions, because the scheme is using high band water, so unreliable water effectively, 
the farmers are using up their stored water that they've paid for in Coleridge. So they have to let Trust Power know um, by about six o'clock every day that they want X cubic metres of water delivered tomorrow and what that flow rate will be. So they're busy at the moment depleting what they hoped they wouldn't have to use until probably February or March next year. That's, That's scary. It's really scary. It is. I mean, um, there will be the potential, probably, hoping we get some flows, to actually use uh, a second fill. Um, and you can do that, but you have to use all your first paid for water before you can actually apply to use some of that extra water that might be available uh, at a later date. And the question mark is might be. It, I think the big question mark right now is might because these rivers, the big rivers, these alpine rivers are not benefiting at all from the El Nino conditions that we're getting. And that's because the, there's just not, there's not enough rain coming over the top. Yeah, look, uh, you know, you, you watch the forecasts and, you know, Fiordland and, and South Westland's going to get 200 millimetres and, you know, we might get 150 millimetres in the headwaters. Well, when you look at the clarity of the rivers, I don't think I've seen the, the Rakai River or the Waimakari River very dirty for about six weeks. Uh, and that's a concern because if it's spilling over, it will be dirty at the... At the Absolutely. Place. Tony, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we'll be talking to Amy Adams. Uh, let's talk about rural hospitals. What's happening there? Well, what we're doing is making sure that every rural hospital and major health centre is connected to broadband. So you might say, why? Well, I tell you that it's because with high-speed internet into our hospitals, it means that every rural hospital can have access to the best specialists, uh, instant transmission of x-rays, instant diagnosis of specialist reports. So what it's about, Rob, is, is making sure our rural uh, communities have high-speed, responsive, world-leading uh, health services at their fingertips. So it's, it's really exciting, and it's all part of this whole transmission to sort of digital services across New Zealand. Because health services in the rural sector are hard because of distance. They're hard. And it's hard to get specialist staff. You know, it's hard to have a, a urologist or a cardiologist in, in the community, and having to wait for them to come and uh, assess your reports or the like is, is, is more delay. So what this means now is that every one of our rural hospitals across New Zealand is now connected to ultra-fast fibre. That's world-leading high speed so those results can go straight to the best specialist wherever they are uh, and that uh, that diagnosis and treatment plan can be responded to instantly and in the future what's really cool is it'll mean that people will be able to stay in their own homes far longer and receive real-time monitoring from their health professionals so instead of having to leave your community and go somewhere else for treatment or monitoring we'll be able to make that happen at home for people so they can stay with their families and with their communities so it's a pretty exciting future are you doing anything or is it possible to get more GPs into the rural area because it's, yeah. it's not sexy for them? No, look it is hard and we've done a lot of work with, with, with voluntary bonding so what we've said is if you'll sign up to work in rural communities and hard to staff places then we'll write off your student loan progressively over the time that you're there. So we're not doing it on a compulsory scheme, that's, that's not our brand but we are saying if you commit to going to some of those communities uh, we'll meet you with, uh, with some student loan write off and that's been very popular. Uh, but what's getting harder and harder is, is the after hours servicing in rural communities. But then the sort of person who's attracted to the rural area is dedicated and passionate anyway. Yeah, and look, often what happens is even if, they, even if we sort of encourage them to go there with some incentives, once they get into the rural communities, you know, they, they settle in, they become part of the community, they might find a, a handsome local farmer or, or local, uh, local farm girl that, uh, to, to marry and, and get settled into, but, but you know what it's like, once you start living in the rural communities, you don't want to leave, and so we sort of think if we can get them in there, get them working for a couple of years, they become part of those communities, they understand and the benefits of living in the country uh, and then they're hooked in and, and they become a critical part of the community. You're working with Rural Women New Zealand because they're very much mm. feet on the ground. Yeah, we do a lot of work with rural women. So I've worked with them a lot on issues like how we can get better connectivity into rural communities uh, through to issues as diverse as you know, safety on school buses and, and rural GP services and the like. So they've got a, a really good local connection to what's needed and, and where we can put our energy. So I find them a really useful uh, talking, talking point and conduit to, to test ideas with. Is that idea of 20... 20 k's an hour past the school bus. Yeah. It seems to have stalled slightly, so yeah. you may have to shake that cage a bit. Yeah, look, the one that I've been really pleased with in my patch is we've managed to get uh, speed reductions outside the primary schools themselves. Because even though it's already law to do 20 k past a, a school bus, 
most of my rural primary schools you can go past at 100k an hour past the school itself and that to me is just not okay, it's not safe. Uh, so with a, with a bit of help from groups like Rural Women and Fed Farmers we've managed to push certainly the Sowan District Council and some others into having 40k speeds maximum past rural primary schools and I, I'm really proud of that because look that's going to save lives. But 20k's past a school bus either way is still the law and you know if you try and slow down to that often you get abused by other drivers so I think it's something we all have to be more mindful of. But some of their ideas with flashing lights and the things, I think we have to continue to, to try and back. So that already is law? You can already get... law. 20k past a school bus that stopped on the side of a road. It doesn't matter if you're in a 100k zone, if there's a school bus stopped, either direction, whether you're on the same side of the road or not, you have to slow to 20 kilometres an hour. But I tell you what, not many drivers do. Uh, but I, I guess all I'd say is if the worst happened and a kid ran out uh, and you hit them and that child was killed, Quite apart from the legal liability, you, you know, you'll never get over that. So I just would encourage everyone, if you see a school bus or you see a rural primary school, slow down because young children are unpredictable and, and that's a situation that none of us want to be in. How long will it be before that broadband hits the, the rural hospitals? It's done now. So I just put out a press release this morning actually, Rob, you're getting the scoop. <laughs> just confirming that as of today we've, we've completed every rural hospital in New Zealand. So that's really exciting. And now what we're going to see happen is a, a lot more creative telehealth initiatives being designed to use that. So we've put the, the, the super highway in uh, and now we're going to see that the medical profession really start to think about how they can maximise the use of that. So it's live from today, so that's pretty exciting. And across our rural schools, we're up to 97% connected, so we've almost connected every single school as well. So good progress. After the break, it's Stephen Joyce and Joe Goodhue. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. Be Active begins here, in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Natural resources, you've been putting a lot of work into it. Yeah, look, it's a really important part of our business growth agenda. So one of the six streams is the natural resource sector. No surprises to the farming sector as to why, because it's such a huge part of New Zealand's prosperity. Uh, and this is all about achieving the two things we all want, which is improving our productivity, getting continued growth out of our primary sectors to grow jobs in regional New Zealand in particular, while at the same time improving the environmental outcomes. Uh, my strong view is having seen enough of the science around this thing, is that this is one area where if we're smart and we work together, we can have our cake and eat it too. And that's what this uh, natural resources chapter of the BGA is all about. What do you say to those who say, yeah, he's from parliament and he's here to help? I mean, it's, you're going to turn it from theory into practical. Well, look, I mean, the proof of the pudding's in the eating always. And, you know, there's a healthy cynicism around politicians, and that's fair enough. Seven years ago, I wasn't one, and I had the same healthy cynicism, so no problems there. But, look, 
we, what we've found with the business growth agenda is that we, if we do work together, we get the agencies working together with the private sector in a coordinated way, we can achieve a lot. And just got to look at that export markets chapter where we've had a serious approach to chunking through some market access issues. And we now have a Korean FTA, uh, TPPs away, uh, the opportunities are uh, now being looked at for Europe and, and South America. Yeah, there's a lot happening in that space. Natural resources, we've had a lot happening as well. We've got the irrigation funds, uh, we've got uh, uh, progress in, in, in pest control and biosecurity. And the good news is when the agencies work together, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to get the right funding at the right time to get things done. So really, we can start celebrating because we are on the way, Steve. Well, we're on the way. I wouldn't say celebrate necessarily, but I, I, my view is the, the great news out of all of this is that the technology is either now there or almost there to not only improve environmental outcomes from land and water use, but also things such as pest control, which is a big cost for a whole lot of people in both the farming sector and, say, conservation sector. Again, partnerships, uh, we can do a lot more to eradicate pests in this country. So the future is bright. The future is always bright. It's just about getting on and doing the work. So from a more of a sort of a nationwide perspective with Stephen Joyce, now let's have a little chat with Joe Goodhue for a local perspective. Joe, let's look local because we've been looking nationally. What's happening locally? Well, locally I've been able to say here in the Ministry of Primary Industries tent that what we're talking about is delivering to the people of Canterbury our, our government initiatives. That includes the Irrigation Acceleration Fund, the Crown Irrigation Investment Limited, but more importantly, top of mind for people locally at the moment is the effect of the, the downturn in dairy price and also at the El Nino effect, the drought effect. So we're talking about the Rural Support Trust and how we are supporting them to support the farmers and farming families of um, Canterbury and also around the mental health support. So that's businesses getting together with government and everybody realising that the future of the province is around the health of our farming communities. Because they're not all that well known for looking after themselves, are they? No, it's kind of hard for them to reach out and ask for help, but nevertheless, if somebody is always getting out there being in touch, so it's the, it's the vets, it's the agribusiness, it's the community people who will be having a conversation and think, this person to me seems a bit down in the dump. So it's about looking after each other. And government has a role to play in that. The future looks very bright, but it's just a case of many people would see too big a gap between now and then. That's absolutely right. So we need to have a broader, big picture about how to make sure that businesses grow, that businesses are able to be um, you know, robust and get through the bad times, like a, a lower dairy payout or a drought. Um, so we need to manage day to day, but at the same time have a big picture view as to how we can make businesses stronger and sustainable through that. It's nice that we've, we're in the MPI tent because they're going to guard our borders a bit more severely now. Certainly grow and protect, that's the, um, the catch cry, that's the words that we use to describe the, the work of Ministry of Primary Industries. We're celebrating 20 years of the detector dogs and they do a fantastic job on, on the border. But we've got to be so vigilant. New Zealand's primary industries are so um, important to us as an economy that we have to look out for the sort of incursions that can bring our sector to its knees. Very, very important, and for Nathan Guy, our Primary Industries Minister, his number one priority. And I am able to join him alongside of that and, and support him in that role. So we can feel a bit more comfortable because there's a lot of stuff that does arrive at our airports and ports. Oh, I think the whole time that every New Zealander has a role to play, whether that's talking to the visitors that are coming from overseas and impressing upon them the sort of reception they're going to get on our borders, that, that we are not going to accept them bringing food in, that's going to be a danger to our primary industries, but also being good role models ourselves when we're coming through airports, and that's all New Zealanders, and talking about about how important it is that our border is kept secure. Are you doing something with CPIT as well? Ah, yes, Araki Polytech is, um, has announced, so there's a merger being announced between the two polytechnics. Now I see that as being really, really exciting for Araki. Um, they're a very small polytechnic and they will be able to call on the resources of the larger polytech. I think that CPIT has been very focused on Christchurch and that we can help them to deliver education to the rural hinterland. That's something Araki's good at and so I see an exciting 
exciting future. It's been a nervous time for the Aoraki Polytechnic staff and in some ways for the students as well. But I think there is very real prospect now of a bright future. Is they do quite a bit in agriculture with, a, with primary ITO? Um, they certainly do quite a lot and they, they are going to be the agribusiness centre of excellence for the Canterbury region. That's very exciting. Straight after the break, we catch up with Kate Wilkinson, who used to be a politician and sort of quietly disappeared. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active amino acid biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active amino acid biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. When you're in the public eye, obviously everybody has a pretty good idea of what you're up to and you hit the media quite a bit, but what happens when you stop that sort of life? We catch up with Kate Wilkinson to find out what she's been doing. Kate, you're, you've taken up farming now. I have indeed, yeah. And so I've got the worries of the weather and, and the worries of the crop prices and all the rest of it, but I love it. I love it. I love being at that start of the food chain. I love growing barley for beer and things like that. It's really cool. So how's your season going? Oh, well, we had it was dry last year, so well, we didn't quite do as well as the year before, and it's dry this year as well. Um, I have made the decision to go to the BCI scheme, so I'll get water next year, but not this year. So that's, that's a big commitment. Yeah. Bit, bit scary. <laughs> bit tough on the sleeping. Well, well, it's scary actually, it is scary, but, it, but the, the numbers stack up so it should be good and if we can make better use of the land and grow better crops, so I think Canterbury is just fantastic for crops. Oh, yeah, it's got good soils, it's flat and, and we should be growing more of it, so I get quite excited about our crops. Do you miss politics at all? Oh, every now and then sometimes, of course you do, but you don't go back. Um, there's a lot of things I don't miss about it. I like the, the freedom that I've got now to do what I like uh, without the scrutiny of the media, if you, if you like. But, um, and I sometimes see what ha what's happening in the house and I think, well, that's what we see as the public, but that's not what happens because the work is done behind the scenes and I think that's not a good showcase for our political system. It must be pretty exciting, really, when you look at TPP and all of the wonderful figures that are being bantered around for our future as a farming company. Oh, Absolutely. I mean, you know, food is, is the one one of the things that we're so fantastic at. We should be excited about it, about it, and we should be exporting as much quality food that we can overseas. And and if we can get better access to those markets, that, that's just magnificent news. As far as the political things that are unfolding, do you views on such things as Christmas Island? Oh, 
I think it's I, I think it's really serious, but I think it's a bit of a political sideshow. I mean, you've got the opposition saying don't make politics of it, which is exactly what they're doing, of course. Um, you know, countries have their own sovereignty, and and um, you know whether you like it or not, Australia makes its own laws. Um, I don't know what the full story is. I haven't been told. Um, well, I don't think anybody does, really. No, no. I mean, it, it looks it looks pretty bad. It doesn't look as though that's the way you should treat your citizens. Um, yeah, but it's not our country. <laughs> it's not our country, but they are. Some of them are our citizens, aren't they? Uh, even though they haven't really, in spirit, they haven't been our citizens for many, many decades because they gave their heart to Australia, and now that's gone a bit sort of topsy turvy, and, they, and sort of they want our help. I get a bit cynical. I'm allowed to be cynical. Yes, you are allowed to be cynical now, now Kate now, Wilkinson. Yeah, now that I'm not a politician, I'm allowed to be a wee bit cynical. Um, I don't condone you know, mistreating anybody uh, for whatever reason, but uh, we can't solve all the problems of the world. We had a go with the All Blacks winning the World Cup second time around. Oh, wasn't that fantastic? Oh, I, I watched that. I got up at four o'clock. I got the time wrong. I got up at four o'clock in the morning. Um, before half time, I had tears of joy. Just after half time, I had tears of despair. And at full time, I had tears of joy again. They are such wonderful ambassadors, aren't they, for New Zealand? And such nice, nice guys. They just, just, they, you know, they give sportsmanship. They put sportsmanship on a high, much higher new level and I think we could be really, really, really proud. John, I guess there's a lot of stress around at the moment, and one thing leads to another, there's sort of a flow on. Yeah, Rob, and, and to, this is because of how the body's organised, and, and um, the founder of chiropractic, a guy called Daniel David Palmer, a very revolutionary thinker of his time, I mean, we're talking here 100 years ago, um, he... He came up with this idea um, that on top of all the cybernetic systems that run the body, like for instance, we know if your blood sugar goes up, your, your body will release insulin so as to cause the cells to take up sugar and therefore bring the blood sugar back down again and then it, then it suppresses the release of insulin. Now, that's called a cybernetic system. It's a simple feedback loop, you know, and the body temperature does the same thing and digestion does the same thing with stretch receptors in your stomach and your bowel and all that, setting up peristalsis and all of that. But above all that, Palmer noted, was a degree of control. And he also realised that it was unconscious. You, know, so you don't go around thinking, mm, liver working 98%, very good. <laughs> no, you <laughs> don't. Well, you and I probably haven't had a liver that worked at 98% for years anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> it's because of the way you push that, 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 uh, that Scottish spirit into me. But um, he said that this unconscious um, management of the body, he called it innate intelligence. And what it does is, and, and he said it relates to our conscious uh, interpretation of the world, which he called educated intelligence, but conscious and unconscious is sort of a way to think of it. And so when we look at stress, right, what that is, is our interpretation of the world saying, um, uh, this is not a good situation. This represents risk, chronic risk, um, uncertainty, uh, threat, all these things. Uh, that tr trigger a stress response. Innate intelligence then converts all of that into different management systems for the body. So instead of running the body as um, at its high efficiency level, minimum energy loss, right, which isn't a problem now because most of us suffer from uh, energy overload, not energy loss. But when we were a savannah dwelling animal like any other, we had to be efficient. So he ran it at, um, the body ran at high efficiency uh, but it does, that at, uh, it does that at the price of performance. Now, when you're under stress, we try to run at high performance, which we do at the price of energy. The difficulty is that the system was designed to operate where those triggers were uh, at a very, very um, set time period. You know, you might move into a predator zone or there might be a drought or whatever. It might go for months, but it didn't go for years. And like, for instance, here in Christchurch, we are now five years post-earthquake. Mm. About the same time as Daniel David Palmer, right, in 1910, not long after that, New Zealand, almost single-handedly, with a wee bit of help from the Australians, managed to cross the oceans, defeat the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, get home, we did it all in four and a half years. <laughs> well, there you are. And we didn't even have machinery. <laughs> we did it all with horses. So, so when the door slams and you jump? Well, you see, then you see the other thing too is 
uh, he used the term intelligence, and what we know about intelligence is not only does it plan and forward think, but it learns. And so the circumstances around you at the time set up how you're likely to respond because you've become accustomed to it. Uh, and it's a bit like the stuffy room, you don't even notice it. Mm. You know, So you don't notice that your, your back's all, shoulders are all tightened up. That you, you don't notice your gut is uh, gurgling and has sort of lost its good habits and all those sorts of things. Uh, they just become a part of your every day. Um, it's only when they get to a critical point where they're going to cause potential long-term damage that we experience symptoms like nausea or pain or discomfort. And what that is, is in fact your unconscious mind telling your conscious mind, you better do something. That's right, because if, you, if you're in a very bad environment, your stomach will not. It will, it will. And that's simply, uh, and, and everything about that was actually quite useful. I mean, you're increasing your gastric secretion. You're, you're shutting down, um, which is increasing the amount of acid in the stomach, which is there means if you end up swallowing some mud or dirt or whatever in the, in the scrap, you've got more acid in there to kill the bugs. You're shutting down food, leaving the gut, the pyloric sphincter, and at the other end of the small intestine, you're shutting down food, moving into the large intestine through the uh, ileocecal valve. Now, that purpose is to shut down digestion so you can shunt blood away from the gut and put it into the muscles and the brain and the heart, all of which were critical to a fight-flight response, you see. Not good if it goes on for a long time because then the gut starts to engage in dysfunction and you get all those symptoms that come out of chronic stress, you know, loose stools, constipation, gas and wind, bloating, da 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 da. All those things that, yeah, but, but they, they sneak up on you. You said They sneak up on you. And, and then what happens is you get very close to failure and then you have a bit of a food that, you, that might challenge you a wee bit. And what you go is you go, oh, that caused it. It must have been that. Whenever I hear the word must have been, I know that isn't it. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Because you've you've talked to me about pulling a pair of socks on and putting your back out. It's got nothing to do with your feet. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, no. No, what it means is that, you know, your diaphragm's not working because you're suppressing your emotional control by controlling your breathing. You know, your gut's probably a bit dodgy, so you can't put too much weight through your abdomen anyway. Uh, you haven't been sleeping that well, so you're suffering from a chronic overall muscle fatigue and neurological fatigue, which means the integration of the nerves and muscles isn't working that well. And then you go and put a sock on. Uh, and your body weight's in the wrong position and you actually do do some low-grade um, soft tissue damage or you blow a disc, in which case you've done some serious soft tissue damage uh, and you're up for surgery. Um, and so these things are never, they are never the final event, unless it's something big like parachute failure. We go, yeah, it's probably, well, it's yeah, probably yeah, mechanical. That way. is a bit sort of, you know, but, you know, <laughs> Except, but it, ex if it's slightly like, external influence. Yeah, yeah, if it's the banal everyday stuff, and you didn't cope with it, then it's because you, all this stuff is built up behind it. Ever wondered why a parachutist who's going feet first wears a helmet? <laughs> no, that is a good point. I think we'll put it this way, right? By the time your helmet counts, things are bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So people, any one of those symptoms that you've just been describing, um, what do they do? What do people do? Or if they're watching somebody who... Or seeing that happen to someone in their family. Yeah, I mean, the rural sector, I actually feel the rural sector's got just a little bit of positive in it right now, you know, as long as we don't get this severe El Nino drought. Which, which is, is here. Which is, yeah, yeah. So North Canterbury, there's probably not a lot of positive still. But um, um, uh, I think when you see these things happening, the first thing is to recognise that the social presentation, you know, the behaviour and the grumpiness and the shortness and all that, they are merely the surface manifestations. It's important to recognise that this person is under chronic stress and help them recognise it's under they're under chronic stress. Um, and and a bit of it, you know, that that the, the ad for Lifeline where they showed the giant snowball, and you know, and then the person catches it in the hand and they actually realise that it's not as big as they thought it was. You know, most farmers are still sitting on a massive piece of equity, and um, and so if they're under that sort of pressure, just sit back and think and go, well, you know, no one's making more land. Well, the Chinese are, but you know, yeah, right. okay. but that's way the hell up near the Philippines. It is really, you don't have to worry about well it. past the airport. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> long past, yeah. So really, it, it's just recognise it and, and accept it. Yeah, and, and and do the positive things. You know, look, Rob, you'd be surprised when I talk to patients how many don't go to bed on time, how many don't drink water. You know, uh, uh, how many don't take a break on a long weekend like the one we've just had. You know, they. they or, or they can think of a break as vegetating in front of the television. You know, we've got to get out there and do positive things because life's not just about addressing the negatives, it's also about doing the things that help um, buffer us against 
uh, the traumas of everyday life. Thank you very much indeed. If you'd like to check out John's interview again, don't forget you can find that on ontheland.co.nz. I'm Rob Cope Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed the program, but it will be back the same time next week. Until then, bye now.